Uh, welcome back to Race and Policing, y'all. Thank you for continuing the conversation. Thank you to all of our panelists, recurring and new, who are here to have this discussion with us. My name is Yvette Lillian Relius Powell. I'm a student at CSUSB study, studying Communication and Environmental Studies. Um, we don't have our co-host Marlo with us here today, but we're going to keep the show rolling. As you know, we like to do a land acknowledgement for each show just to honor the land that CSUSB is on. It goes like this. We recognize that California State University San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the California State University San Bernardino community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and Indigenous peoples. I want to go ahead and introduce our first panelist who is going to be um, giving an, an acknowledgement as well, uh, Dr. Angela Clark Luke, Professor of Educational Leadership at CSUSB, is the co-author of the recently acclaimed book, Equity Partnerships and Culturally Proficient Guide to Family, School, and Community Engagement. Her research focuses on anti-racist and equity leadership to dismantle racist and exclusionary policies and practices such as zero tolerance that contribute to the school to prison pipeline. Dr. Luke, please. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for inviting us and having us here. I, along with my colleagues, will um, discuss and examine the issue of um, over-policing of Black girls. So, but before we do that, let me do a uh, labor and life affirmation. Um, we pay homage to those who were stolen from Africa, placed in bondage, falsely named as chattel and forced into labor, who were called slaves, but never submitted as such, who have always been fully human with an unbroken connected connection to the divine and to each other. We honor our African ancestors for the still unpaid labor which built what is now the Americas. To both our indigenous and African forebears, we commit to the continued struggle for liberation and reparations, for it is only through freedom and justice that we truly give honor, Ashe. And that is used by the California Faculty Association African American Caucus, and it was written by Dr. Melina Adila. So thank you. Um, before we move forward with Dr. Luke, as you know, we share a bit of good news every week. And so we have here some good news, or at the very least, something good to hope for. An officer who was fired from the Philadelphia Police Department in 2018, following the 2017 murder of Dennis Plowden, has been charged with first degree murder, third degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, and, position, and possession of an instrument of crime. After intervention from the media back in 2013, highlighting the deadly patterns of Philadelphia's police force, their own commissioner pushed for the implementation of reforms that affected an approximate 84% decrease in police shootings between 2012 and 2019. Now, while I personally believe that there's no reason that there needs to be an 84% decrease in police shootings for me to feel comfortable in your city, um, I am happy to hear that this is moving forward justly. Our thoughts are with Plowden's widow. She is the one who filed the lawsuit against the former officer. She reports that she's happy to take good news to her late husband's grave, although she feels it is still a long road before Roosh is found guilty for murdering her husband. So our thoughts are with her. I would like to pass it back to Dr. Angela Luke to continue her presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'm going to introduce the panel and then we'll look at the videos that we have, okay? First of all, we have Dr. Shelley Holt and um, 
Shelly, I've been knowing Dr. Shelly for a while now. Oh, it says screen sharing has stopped us. Okay, I don't know. Um, Dr. Shelly Holt is a former superintendent and um, I've been knowing her for a while now. She is the CEO of Leadership Legacy Consulting. I hope I'm saying that right. And um, she'll tell you more about herself. Um, and also we have Ms. Felicia Jones who is with us and Felicia is a part of the organization called COPE and they work here and do lots of uh, community work here in the uh, San Bernardino area, parent and family and community partner. And then we also have Dr. Talisa Sullivan, the school administrator for social emotional healing, who's also uh, been in the Inland Empire and is also um, the CEO of the Transformational Leadership Consulting Group. So we'll talk more about them later, but our topic today is on over the over-policing of black girls. So we're gonna show you two quick videos. One is um, about a six-year-old girl who was arrested. Um, and you'll see that one, and that one is just a few minutes, and then we'll come right behind that and show the second video. The desert goes okay she's gonna have to come with us now the desert goes okay she's gonna have to come with us now okay Kai, you stand gotta up. go with them baby girl stand up okay come over here all right those four it's for you keep your hands okay come over here honey <laughs> Images of a six year old girl being arrested at school. That's the voice of Farmington police officer Zachary Christensen, who walked the halls of Mesa View as a resource officer for the past four years. Here, he's talking about a sixth grade student who's in trouble. This morning, she went straight to the cafeteria. She took more milks than she was supposed to. She threw a milk on the ground. At this point, the girl is waiting for her mom to pick her up. We are concealing her face and identity because she's a minor. The vice principal and, and principal have been following her around. According to Officer Christensen's field report, the child assaulted two school employees. But take a look at the lapel camera footage. This is what the officer claimed was the first assault as the student walks past the assistant principal. And this is what the officer says was the second assault. Can't push him out of the way. The girl tries to move past the principal to open the door. Then Officer Christensen loses his patience. Okay, I've okay. had enough of this. Take your bag off. Take your bag off. You're done. You're done. You're done. You're not going to assault the principal. The officer's lapel camera is knocked to the ground, but a school employee repositions it, capturing what happens next. Put your arms behind your back. Put your arms behind your back. Ow! Get off me! Get off me! Ow! Get off me! Stop! Oh. Resist! 
The school administrator continues telling the officer to allow the girl to get up. Officer Christensen, she is not a threat to yourself or others at this moment. In the report, the officer writes, quote, she was very strong, stronger than I was. Again, a school employee tells the officer this has gone too far. Sir, we are not going to use excessive force to get this done. We're not excessive. Yes, it is. She's an 11-year-old girl. And it's a shock to the system to see that this is a thing that it can occur at a school by a certified peace officer. Attorney Mark Kernut is representing the student and her mother. They're now taking legal action against both the city of Farmington and the school. When you have a situation where there's a report that says a felony is committed, another felony is committed, and then you review the factual documentation you have of that through the video, and it doesn't add up. I want to go yeah! then there must be a level of accountability. When I contacted the Farmington Municipal School District, a spokesperson told me they could not comment on pending litigation nor on personnel matters. However, they did send us this brief statement, quote, the safety of our students and staff is one of our highest priorities. Meanwhile, at Farmington Police Headquarters, Chief Stephen Hebby tells us uh, this no. video immediately triggered an internal investigation into Officer Christensen's conduct. I was angry. You know, that, that's not our standards. That's not who we are. That's not how we train. Why are you pushing me? Because you are not free to leave now. Why? Because Why? I said so. You're being charged okay, well, give with me assault, with Please. resisting. Those charges against the student ultimately didn't stick, and Officer Christensen was placed on administrative leave the very next day. What would you say to those folks who see an officer, someone in a position of power, taking those actions? Stuff like this is, is tough for the citizens to take, there's no doubt about it. As a chief, you know, you know darn well th that this is a failure for us. Our four investigates team has learned following the department's internal review, Officer Christensen was slapped with two violations for violating use of force policy and for unsatisfactory performance. It's such a mess because we didn't follow the things that we know we should have been following. You know, we've been training on this. We talk about de-escalating. We talk about slowing things down. You know, and that didn't happen here. Was he up to date on his training? He was. Still, the chief says the department moved quickly to discipline the officer. Unfortunately, we, we did view the discipline as likely to be very serious, and the officer separated you know, effective October 1st. So he resigned? He did. Now, I spoke with Officer Christensen on the phone. He did not want to comment. Now, it's important to note that he has not been criminally charged, but this case has been referred to the San Juan County District Attorney's Office to consider possible charges. Nathan O'Neill, for Investigates. Angela, I believe you're muted. Thank right. you. Thank you so much for um, showing those videos. It's really heart wrenching every time I see them. Um, am I able to share my screen now, Ben? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, I know those videos were hard to watch, um, but just imagine these are girls who have experienced those traumas. Um, so we're going to continue on, and uh, what I want to do is just kind of give you some foundational information. Um, again, we're going to have the experts here. Um, they're going to talk to us about um, some of the issues that arise when these things happen with the over-policing, and we call that over-policing of Black girls, and these are students in the classrooms. Um, first of all, there's a national um, system that's going on here. And the national thing of it is, is that it's happening all over. Black girls are obviously experiencing disproportionate discipline consequences more than any other group, starting even at the level of preschool. At preschool, Black girls make up about 20% of kindergartners or preschool that are enrolled, but 54% of the girls are the ones that are being suspended from preschool. Suspended from preschool. Inequitable exclusionary disciplinary practices 
occur because there are many forms of racism that are that is occurring in the schools and that racism is based upon or is uh, comes out through intersectionality because of being black and female invisibility and stereotyping what ends up happening is there's this implicit biasness that occurs the implicit biasness from some school officials goes into or transforms into the practices that are going on at the school, which is then undergirded by the zero tolerance policies, which then goes into the suspensions and the expulsions, which then feeds into the school to prison pipeline. So it's a cycle that goes on. The zero tolerance discipline uh, policies, and I'm sure some of the uh, ladies are going to talk to you more about this, but the policies have been adopted for over 20 years, and they first started off with, I think, um, just on drug and substance abuse, but then they began expanding to include um, disruption or disrespect, and so that way they included more of the incidences with Black females. Now, here's a screen that I want you to really pay attention to, so I wanted to get to this. But these are just some of the incidences that have occurred recently over the past 10 to 12 years or so. Um, and so I, we've listed them out, uh, Dr. Sullivan and I listed them out in um, our, our research paper. But just look at this, from even 2007, there was a six-year-old girl arrested. And from the video that you just saw, that just happened last year. That wasn't long ago. Um, look at the other one from 2007. 16-year-old girl was arrested in a California school for dropping cake on the floor and then failing to pick it up to a school officer's satisfaction. That to me is absurd. And we've got to do something about this because this over-policing and arresting someone for dropping cake on the floor is, is just a bit, that's a bit much. Um, and if you look at some of the others, um, notice also that they're in different states. So it's not like you can say this only happened in California or this only happened in New York. It's all over the country. That means it's systemic. Um, you've got Illinois, Alabama, and so on and so forth. You've got girls being suspended or threatened with expulsion for wearing their hair in braids, um, those kinds of things. And so just take a look at these and just know that um, we're here, two reasons to, uh, one, to examine and look at some of these policies and these practices and to heighten, bring some more awareness to what's going on. And then number two, also to think about what can be done. How can we assist and support our educators and parents in working together to resolve some of these issues? Now, um, Ms. Felicia Jones has been working in the San Bernardino area with the universe, with uh, San Bernardino Unified School District. And this is just uh, some of the data that they have come up with. And she'll talk more to you about that. But this is where students interact with police in San Bernardino. If you look over here, 67% of the arrest locations were on campus. So it's not like it's just all out in the community or the neighborhood. It is on the school grounds. The citations that were noted were on campus as well. Almost 90% of the citations that were uh, given out were given out through school police or through um, police at the school. One of the other slides from uh, COPE um, is from um, looking at this information about Black and Latina girls are the only girls being arrested. And that just um, uh, confirms and affirms the work that Kimberly Crenshaw did and her work of pushed and over-policing Black girls, where they found in the entire state of New York, 90% of the expulsions were of Black girls and not one was of a white girl in the entire state of New York. So the same thing was found here, looking at the school climate in San Bernardino, you see which ones represent the black girls and which ones represent Latino girls, but no other group of girls. So this is an epidemic and we've, uh, we are here to have that discussion. So we're gonna look at some of the patterns and listen to some of the experts talk about um, what we can do and to see what was going on. Okay, so um, 
thinking about the first video, so let's start there, ladies. At the first video, six-year-old girl um, arrested, and um, just to give some background, um, she was arrested and not just handcuffed and arrested, but she was also booked. She was also fingerprinted. She was fingerprinted at six years old and put in the back of a police car. Um, let, let's start with Dr. Shelley Holt, because she's going to talk to us a little bit about like the trauma of this all. Dr. Holt, what did you see in that video, that two minute clip from um, that police officer's cam that, um, that, that we just saw a few minutes ago? Um, uh, there's so much, there's so much there. I want to give a little context to where I'm coming from. Um, thank you so much for having me here. My name is Dr. Shelley Holt and I uh, run two organizations. Uh, one is Leadership Legacy Consulting, uh, which does leadership and law enforcement consulting regarding these exact types of issues. Uh, moving people towards cultural proficiency, racial equity, and anti-racism tactics that we can use in the school system. I also run a, a nonprofit, they're meeting upstairs, uh, called Family Legacy 5. And that is to focus on the, the work that we need to do within our families to prevent this from happening in the first place. Oftentimes, um, what this is a result of is some sort of trauma uh, that has occurred in the life of the child, in the life of the perpetrator. It could be all around, since there's so much trauma around us these days, it's sometimes very hard to pinpoint. But in, in uh, first incidents, uh, what I saw very clearly, oh, let me give you a little bit of context of why I'm here. Uh, so I have been, yes, my final position was as superintendent of the 14th largest district here in the state of Michigan. But I'm born and raised in Southern California, graduated from Valley View High in Moreno Valley. Um, I have been a district office level administrator in Los Angeles Unified, in Fontana Unified, in Twin Rivers Unified, as well as the uh, Grant Union High School District before it became Twin Rivers. So we had the one uh, four district uh, unification that occurred in the uh, state of California in recent years. I was part of that too. And in each of these places, I've also been in Hayward in the Bay Area, graduated from Berkeley, and I started teaching. So yes, I am a teacher first. I started teaching in East Oakland, um, right there on 35th and MacArthur. Uh, and 17 out of, my, uh, out of 25 of my kids had ankle monitorism. Let me tell you something. In 20 years, 20 years of working in some of the most challenging schools that we have in the state of California and now in Michigan, I have never in my career put handcuffs on a six-year-old. I have never put handcuffs or, ha or had my uh, company officer, because we do have some leeway with our officers, put handcuffs on anyone who had not committed something that was considered an actual felony, meaning that they've actually murdered someone. That happens. Unfortunately, it does. That they've actually done something that we need to be um, taken care of by penal code that I could not take care of by ed code. And I can tell you, I can count on both hands in 20 years the number of kids that um, I've actually had to have removed in handcuffs, and on one hand, the number of kids that were actually booked. So that's 20 years in some of the uh, most challenging environments that we have in our school system. Never in my life would I have um, imagined that we would be watching a video of a six-year-old pleading not to be put into handcuffs and not to be traumatized any further than she obviously already was. What I saw, Dr. Luke, in that video was that the child was sitting down reading a story. That's what I saw. Now, I get it. She may have done, and I have had children that have been some whirlwinds of some kids. I've had to put, I know, it's not to say I haven't had to sit and hold a child for 45 minutes in a very um, strategic hold until they calm themselves down. I've done that too. As an administrator, yes, with the heels and everything on, we get on the ground and we work with our babies. That's what we do. What we do not do is enlist officers to arrest children who are now sitting down reading a book. That's what I saw. And so whatever had occurred before, and I did read some of the reports where she had, um, I think, kicked a teacher, and that happens. I've been a first grade teacher as well. Guess what? I got kicked, and I survived. Um, and yes, it, it did hurt. Um, the child was having a tantrum, and, those, and that's what happens, because guess what? They are six years old. 
And there's a certain thing about looking at the age level and the, uh, the development of the prefrontal cortex, which has to do with executive functioning, which actually does not fully develop in males until about 25 and females till around 22, 23. And so we're literally dealing, as I used to say when I was a principal, you're literally dealing with brainless individuals because they do not have the executive functioning to actually say, hmm, maybe I shouldn't kick the person because I'm having a meltdown. Their brains literally are not able to do that. So I'm going to speak to this for um, the two minutes that I have left. Yes, I'm timing myself because uh, I can actually go for hours on this, and I do with my um, with my organization, but I want to talk to you a couple about a couple things. First thing is ed code versus penal code. What I saw in that video was an abusive penal code. That whatever it was that she did could have been taken care of by ed code. And when, and what you have to understand within the school system is that we have an entire educational code of laws and regulations that we can operate by to uh, essentially dis, uh, dish out discipline. It's what we uh, it's what we abide by. We also have penal code, which is what the police officers operate by. Those are felonies and misdemeanors. And when you look at the two books side by side, which I've done many times before, we do have an opportunity in many cases to make a decision as officials and administrators about whether or not we were going to be operating in ed code or in penal code. Now, I can confess this. Many times I've been sitting in front of young people and I've said to them, okay, you can deal with me in ed code or you can deal with the officer standing next to me in penal code. And let me tell you, by the time they get to be in high school and they have the a little bit of the executive functioning that they need to be able to deal with this, 10 times out of 10, they say, Dr. Holt, or I was Dr. Jones at the time, uh, I would rather deal with uh, uh, ed code and let me know what I need to do. What I also saw in that video was that the young lady could have been waiting for grandma, auntie, mom, whoever to come and pick her up. And this occurred in both, you know, uh, both videos. And in those instances, what I saw was administration and law enforcement had the opportunity to not further traumatize and to actually deal with these children in a humane way. The other thing I just want to bring up is the epigenetic trauma that many children of African descent experience simply because you are born African-American. Well, what do you mean by that, Dr. Holt? You're using all these big words and, and, and you, now you're showing off that doctor from USC. What are you talking about? Well, let me tell you a little bit of what I'm talking about. What I mean is that uh, over 400 years, our, our people have been traumatized. It is, whether you wanna argue it or not, I'm not interested in having that debate. The, the historical data is there. What we also know is that during um, there was uh, research done right after the Holocaust on survivors of the Holocaust and the trauma that their children experienced only one in two generations uh, removed from the Holocaust that changed their DNA in the markers where they were able to deal with stress, depression, and, and trauma, essentially. And so what they noticed in these, uh, in these Holocaust victim survivors' children is that their DNA had been changed in certain markers that were, were able, enabling them to deal with trauma and stress. So here's my question to you as we continue. If we know scientifically, and we won't even talk about the fact that, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, why we're, when this study was done, because it was done obviously after the Holocaust based on white Holocaust, uh, people who identify as white Holocaust victims, if after five years of the Holocaust, now remember, I'm not saying the Holocaust was not a horrific event in history. Yes, it was. It was absolutely horrific. But it lasted five years. And then people were moved and, and the entire world came together to bring people in who had been victims and provide them with a better life for themselves. If that occurred after five years, and yet we still had epigenetic trauma that existed in their children's children. So these are the grandchildren who we saw these difference in markers in. What do you think has happened with the African-American population or descendants of African, of African people who were enslaved after 400 years of untreated and denied trauma? What do you think has happened? And with that, we know that these children are coming to us obviously traumatized, if not just because they simply walked in the door, but it could be because of something that happened, that we need to have a trauma-informed leadership approach. And in that situation, I'll be honest with you, I do not blame the police officers. I look directly at the administrators because we had the opportunity to stop that before they even got there. Thank you. Okay. 
thank you so much for that um, well thought out response. Thank you so much. Miss Felicia Jones, as a um, parent in the community, yes. um, how would you respond to this? What did you see as a uh, community yeah, activist? Sure. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this panel. Um, you know, it, it, it's definitely heartbreaking to see that. But unfortunately, what we see in the uh, policing of girls and black girls and women is uh, unfortunately all too common. Uh, in terms of um, that kind of sort of violent and aggressive um, engagement with Black females. And, I, and so much of it, I, I really believe, is rooted in um, really myths and, and stereotypes about Black women that really um, assign aggression to us uh, and also um, really view us uh, in a lot of ways uh, as men. So, and there is, you know, there is, um, there are myths around that. So when you see the officer's report addressing the strength of the, of the girl, it in a lot of ways attempts to address the need for that level of restraint, that level of engagement. Um, there is a, a, a professor, uh, Dr. Um, Philip Goff, who has done a lot of great work around implicit bias. He calls this an identity trap. Uh, and it actually forces an immediate sort of reaction because we've been conditioned to view people a certain way, which then triggers an automatic response. In the case of Black girls and Black women, when there is an act of what, what may appear to be defiance, which in this case uh, was just their, 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 um, their unwillingness to comply with whatever their administrators wanted them or teachers wanted them to comply with. And then this escalated response that um, that ultimately has huge, huge implications more for the student, both in terms of trauma, but also in terms of their their history, their record, the record that follows. This is the reason why, as 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 a community-based organizations, we started to look at arrests. We started to look at um, citations and disciplinary uh, actions in. San Bernardino and just countywide because we saw a trend and a, and a trend that was unfortunately impacting black students disproportionately, but there were long-term long -term implications when we actually um, ascribed an arrest or a citation as the discipline practice. So we've got kids who, uh, who got citations and we learned that those citations came with fines, those citations later, and they were not paid, became, um, became um, uh, a record that then would, would prevent them from getting a driver's license even before they could get one. So if a kid was actually given a citation in elementary school, parents usually never knew about it until they go and try and go get a driver's license. And we find out that they cannot and they've been, uh, they've been uh, banned from getting a driver's license until they clear that up. And by then the, the ticket is, has doubled. So then the other piece that became a challenge was uh, students who wanted to go into the military, students who wanted to apply for internships. We, our, our own children could not um, take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, we had a scholar, a, um, a scholar, a, a stellar student who went for a White House internship and that that citation that happened in the fifth grade, he never had an issue again, ended up, was flagged as part of his uh, background check. So th this is, this is, this is the kind of, um, this is, this is the kind of um, challenges that come when we actually, uh, when we, when we go to policing as the solution to discipline, uh, because it has long-term implications for, for our children, it certainly has long-term implications for our girls uh, who we know are disproportionately affected, but our eyes are mostly on boys and we never really give the kind of attention to girls. Uh, this has been the anchor of our work as, as part of really um, community pushing systems leaders to say, we can't, we can't continue to pursue these, these um, practices. Uh, and do further harm to uh, to black children. 
Okay, thank you so much for that response. And let me just add that black girls are usually um, grouped in a way such that um, they're either with the black males as the data is presented or with girls as the data is presented. So it's not pulled out um, to look at that intersection of being black and female. So a lot of times the data is about us as black women is hidden, it's, it's hidden. But this time now, because of these um, atrocious kinds of things happening and um, the statistics are so alarming, we are seeing more and more of that information. All right, Dr. Sullivan, um, what did you see in, in that video from your perspective? Oh, well, I saw a lot. I was listening to the other ladies speak, and um, I, I'm glad that there are so many different lenses here. Um, a little bit about me. I'm an um, administrator, county administrator, and um, also um, CEO of Transformational Leadership Consulting Services and creator of a new framework called um, Quantum 10, which I can share later. But I, I mentioned Quantum 10 because of the elements that are involved with the Quantum 10. And I was going to mention positive behaviors, interventions, and supports, or some sort of um, behavioral support system. But I don't mention that alone because I know that there, um, a lot of times, we look at uh, just positive behaviors, interventions, and supports alone as a as a system in itself that kind of keeps kids in in line with what we with the behavioral expectations that we set. And so, with the framework that I've developed, it talks about the it, the intersectionality. I'll say that, but the integration of a fusion of frameworks, theories, and practices that you don't, let's try not to do these in silo. Um, we want to make sure that they're fused. And so I, I speak about that because specifically I want to talk about restorative practices, which is which should be more of a preventative. Sometimes it can be reactive, but for the most part, it's more preventative. And so what I saw was I saw, I, I heard Dr. Shelley mention um, seeing a young girl reading. And so what I what I what I wrote down that I saw was a young, a young girl, and she was calm, she was inquisitive. I could hear the the um, the teacher or the instructor, um, you know, giving her information as if she had asked a question about something and kind of gave it to her again. Um, and I saw her um, inquisitive about the process as the police officer came in, I'm like, "Hey, what is that? And who is that for?" And you know, um, and then as soon as she realized that it was for her, what I saw was what Dr. Shelley mentioned: the trauma um, that this young six-year-old will never, ever, ever escape. She will always remember that day that time when what we could have done was we could have been restorative. Um, I heard also that she, she whatever took place before, and, and I want to share this with our audience, because a lot of times what we say, and, and, I'm, and, and I'm saying we, and I'm including myself, we say, well, what did the kid do? I'm, I'm, I'm asking us to stop asking that question, because no matter what we do or what they've done, the, some of the behavior that we um, see as a result is not acceptable. And I want you to think about your own kid. When you ask yourself the question, what did the kid do? Think about what, whether or not that was your student, your own child, and would you want that same exact egregious act happening to your child? And if the answer is yes, I'm sad for that kid, but the answer is probably no. I don't want anyone handcuffing my six-year-old, my eight-year-old, my 12-year-old, boy or girl. I want them to do some restorative um, something to restore the relationship. So with restorative practices talks about, it looks at a way of looking at um, things that have been done, harm that has been caused, just as that, as harm that has been caused and looking at repairing relationships versus be, having punitive actions. And so what the lens that I'm coming from is the restorative lens. So first we need to do some, some, um, some uh, proactive some proactive strategies, maybe like in incorporating positive behaviors and supports intertwined with restorative practices and trauma-informed practices, also with our cultural lens, culturally responsive practices. So we're looking at integrating the practices, the theories, the frameworks, using you know things like Maslow's hierarchy of needs to think about what does this kid need before we go into um, you know handcuffing or or putting them out, you know, exclusionary discipline. Um, where they're sitting outside the classroom. So we need to go in from that perspective prior to coming down with the consequence. And then if we do have a consequence, which there's a consequence for all of our behaviors. As a consequence, I go to work every day, I get paid. You know, that's a consequence. It happens to be a very positive consequence and it, and it actually matches the, the behavior. 
I go to work, I take care of business, I do my job, I get a paycheck. So I'm saying if we have a consequence, can the consequence match the behavior? So if the student was rebellious, acting out, what type of consequence can we provide where the student can relearn whatever the expectations are and, have, and having that match whatever behavior that they are having versus the punitive actions that none of us would want done to our own kids. But it, give, giving them a record, it broke my heart to hear um, Felicia talk about the student who you know, was going to the White House, I think you said, to have an internship. And then there was a red flag up because they had a, a citation in fifth grade and we have to absolutely stop this. We have to stop where we are um, allowing for, um, you know, things to happen to our kids in general. The other thing I, um, I heard Dr. Shelley mention about the, um, about the um, police officers and, and which it's on us as administrators, so I'm an administrator. And I will tell you that I, I, will, own part, I will own part of that. Um, and, and I'll say this because sometimes we don't know what steps to make next. Cause I know that I, I, I have been on a campus where I have intervened when the police have been called and I've intervened and, and it was, um, I was reprimanded by the police. Just let, letting you know, reprimanded. It was like, no, when we get called, you step back. Don't step in and try to save the situation. And I'm thinking, but this is my baby. And at the end of the day, and this is what I'm saying in my head, because at this time I'm thinking, uh oh, I'm about to go next. Got my hands behind my back, I'm ready to go. You know, but, um, but at the same time, there has to be that um, collaboration where we have an understanding where we say if you are called I'm calling you because there is something that is taking place that has escalated you know um, but I, we need to have an understanding that at the end of the day this is my campus and I do want to resolve the situation without law enforcement um, and if I can't resolve it I let me step in and say hey I got this from here which is what's not happening on campuses we step back and we allow for the police to take the six-year-old we allow for the police to continue um to um to handcuff you know or to wrestle with the girl and um i, I was talking at a, on another forum and i was saying i um you know i'm an i'm an i'm an advocate i'm an advocate truly advocate and i do protest but the way i protest is a, behind the screen kind of right here and in other types of in, you know uh, uh settings i don't i don't necessarily go to the street and march because with me i already know i'm gonna be one with the handcuffs behind my back because when stuff is happening you know that fight flight or freeze you know, we got some people that are fighters, some people like take off, the others freeze. I believe wholeheartedly I'm a fighter. So I have to be very careful as to not to be out there fighting because then I'm, I'm, I'm losing the battle because then I'll end up somewhere that I, where I can't advocate for our kids. But um, uh, I'm gonna end there and say restorative practices, starting with preventative methods. If we're going to be using programs, well, we should be using programs like positive behaviors and supports where we are um, providing those expectations or collaborating with students as we share in what the expectations on campus are going to be. And then when those are not met, asking questions, restorative questions, what happened rather than what did you do? You know, just asking those restorative questions and, and building those relationships with our students so that um, at the end of the day, they will, they will manage their own behaviors. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much for um, all three of you with the, the answers or the responses to that question of what did you see? It's obvious that you, your own expertise areas come through uh, with your responses. So I'm just going to go to another part to that. So what can be done to de-escalate these kinds of situations? I mean, I'm still, you know, thinking about the six-year-old and why wasn't the parent called? Because in my neighborhood, I mean, somebody could have been called or come to see, call TT, call Big Mama, call Madea, call, call Aunt Hazel, who used to live across the street from me. I mean, call somebody. Can somebody else come in besides the police? Or is there a list of people that are on the card, you know, to be called. So let's let's talk about that because we want to make sure that we're again heightening the awareness of this issue, but also coming up and talking about some other practices, the restorative practices that Dr. Sullivan mentioned, and cultural proficiency uh, practice, which is uh, one of the areas that I write about in in my book, Equity Partnerships: A Culturally Proficient Guide to uh, Family School and um, community engagement. So let's think about that. What can be done with de-escalation so that we can de-escalate and try to bring some of that, all that excitement down so that we don't see videos like this of six-year-olds and 11-year-olds, my goodness, um, 
being uh, arrested, handcuffed, and booked. Um, so let's start there. Dr. Um, Dr. Jones, uh, Shelley, I see Dr. Jones on the screen. Dr. Holt. <laughs> Dr. Jones Holt. I, I had to correct. I was like, oh my goodness, I forgot I to hide it. Yes, yes, and, and honor my daddy. I was like, oh Lord, uh oh. Okay. Um, and I just got in so quick. I just I, I threw it in there. Um, I think there is a couple of things that we can do. First of all, we need to understand the power dynamics that are happening in those situations. And um, I, I, I won't show the, uh, the slide of that. My, my computer's not letting me, but it's all right. There is um, an idea. The fact of the matter is, is that the, in that situation, the child has the least amount of power and they know it. They have the least amount of power and they know it. And so imagine going through life and now you're frustrated, probably traumatized, something has happened. I don't know, really know how to process my emotions. Um, I'm not too sure about my, I mean, I don't have the capacity for uh, executive functioning. And so now, and um, someone mentioned earlier that the, you know, the, the, the amygdala, and so they essentially flip their lid because the prefrontal cortex covers that bad boy, that amygdala is, a, is something else. If you haven't learned about it, you know about it, you just may not know about it. But that amygdala, once you flipped your lid and you've exposed it, you really do have the fight, flight, or freeze response. And you really don't have a, um, much say so over it, even as an adult. So you can imagine where young people are when they're progressing in this. And now you put them in a situation where they literally have zero, little to no power in that situation. So the first thing is for the adults in this situation to recognize the power dynamics. And oftentimes that's where it starts and stops. If the, as an adult, you recognize, yes, I have power and no, my power is not threatened by a six year old or an 11 year old for that matter. And that comes from the confidence of being a, being a confident and knowledgeable administrator. Um, and so if you're thinking about going into the um, education field, know your stuff. If you know your stuff, you have no reason to feel threatened by a six-year-old who's having a tantrum or an 11-year-old who took too many milks and threw one on the floor. That's, you start to understand, when I say know your stuff, understand child development. Understand where these young people are coming from and what could may, uh, be happening for them in their lives in school or outside of school. Also understand the dynamics of just being in school. I'm gonna be quite honest with you. I went to middle school. I went to high school. I went to elementary. And kids were mean. They were mean back then. They become meaner with social media. They are just mean. And that's something that we're working through um, as parents is that we have to work on our kids and their meanness because we got to figure out where those things are coming from. But a lot of this is also young people just dealing with being in middle school or in high school and people being mean. And so who knows, somebody may have made fun of her big toe or, um, you know, I, my name is Shelly. They used to call me Shelly Belly Bowl Full of Jelly and I used to be very, very chunky. And so that would affect me. By the time I got the third period and the third person called me Shelly Belly, somebody was going to get something in the belly and it wasn't going to be any food. So, I mean, that that's just <laughs> where I was coming from at 11, 12 years old because I didn't have the fun. And I didn't want to tell everybody, like, what do I do? Go up to the teacher and say, excuse me, they're making fun of me. Yeah, how does that sound? Because as teachers, the first thing we say is, can you work it out, stop tattletelling, et cetera. So it, it puts these children into very pre, uh, precarious situations. And as adults, as the educated people we are, we are the ones who have a responsibility to recognize that, first of all. Second of all, I think that understanding, uh, like I mentioned before, Ed Code versus Penal Code and the ability to de-escalate. Once, in both of those situations, when I say de-escalate, I'm meaning are they sitting down, calm, not tearing stuff up? That's it. That, at that point, once a child has had a breakdown, or even an adult for that matter, having been a superintendent, let me tell you, the adults act very much like the children at times, and we have to have this same grace and empathy for adults as we do for children, sometimes more so. And so whatever is, has occurred in that moment, that child was, de both of the children were de-escalated. And one point, the, the video, the second video opens up with him saying, she's sitting here waiting for her mother. Why was that not the end of the conversation right there? Click, no, it was a power struggle. It was how dare she you know, put, put up some kind of fight towards me. And this quite frankly is what black women deal with, not just in school, we deal with it at work. We deal with it in the community. We deal with it right now with our, our great Senator Kamala Harris. I recently saw a billboard that said something like Joe and the Hulk. Hello? And is that not something that, I mean, come on now. 
Now, we're not going to break that one down all right, right now, but it all ties in to the overt amount of disrespect that Black women face. I read one study that said Black women are considered the lowest life form on earth. Whoa! Lowest life form. And when we really look at the stratification of, of the social hierarchy created by social Darwinism, which goes back even further, so I don't want to give Darwin that much credit, but for most people, they start understanding it around understanding social Darwinism and the social construct of whiteness and blackness. But when you look at black women are considered the lowest on the totem pole, we got the, we were the last to get the right to vote. We were the last, the last, the last. And so when you look at that and the power dynamics, there were white administrators or white um, uh, people who identified as white in the uh, police officer ranks now feeling threatened by someone who was black. So we cannot ignore the racial dynamics, we cannot ignore the gender dynamics that are happening within this power dynamic and the identities that, um, uh, that power plays. And with power comes privilege. And so when we have privilege and power, quite frankly, it can cause one of two responses. Either people are very fearful of, the, of, of their power and or interestingly enough, they're very appreciative. When the, for the people that have the power, they can either use their power for good or they can abuse it. And I can tell you, sitting in that superintendent seat, um, the first thing that someone said to me is absolute power corrupts. And as I looked around me at people, the people around me, I was just shocked at how much being in a positional power changed people. It changes people. Now, praise God, it did not change me. And that's probably why I'm no longer a superintendent and very proud of it. But when you get into those power positions, it changes people. And people in positions of power, for each and every one of you on this call, should you rise up, and I pray that each and every one of you do, be careful not to let power change you. You heard the officer say, when the, when the man was saying, you're being excessive. No, I'm not. Yeah, I mean, he, it was, he, he was now, the administrator was threatening his power dynamic as a police officer. And what Dr. Sullivan mentioned is absolutely correct. If as an administrator, um, someone asked on the on the chat, why did the teacher allow that to happen? Quite frankly, she didn't want to be next. And most likely that was a counselor or a social worker who did not have any decision-making power at that point. Once you call the police, the situation is technically out of your hands because you've called a higher authority. It's much like when a teacher calls the principal. I used to tell people all the time as, as my teachers, look, when you call me, you can't call me to come in and deal with the situation and then question the manner in which I deal with it. When you call me, you said, I can't handle it. I would like you to take over and support me in this. And that's okay in certain, certain, certain circumstances, but you've got to recognize what you've just done. Part of what also needs to happen is a relationship with your police officers. Um, one of the things that I've instituted um, when I became an executive director and was not um, allowing any officer on my campus that had not been restoratively trained. Talk about controversy. Absolutely, the officers, if you're going to deal with children, needed to be restoratively trained because a police officer is trained in a certain way to operate by penal code. The minute you walk into a school district or a school setting, you now have this uh, uh, person who's operating in penal code that needs to think differently. It's not like dealing with, you know, someone who may be on a, a methamphetamine or some, you know, or, or an alcoholic with a a knife and you know they're enraged and they're about to you know cut someone you're dealing with a 15 year old or a 10 year old or an eight year old and yes there are you know violent children i'm not going to deny that but there are not that many they're not somewhat something that's so widespread it's not like that you have a few and we know how to deal with them so part of this is having the training with officers and administrators part of what i was able to do and I encourage this and I actually teach this within our programs is having officers and administrators aligned together. There was no way when I was in an AP that I could not have said, I got this and my officer not um, acknowledged my request. I got this, even if he was standing right there. Why? Because we formed the relationship between he and I before the incident happened. And so he knew my signal that if I got this, he also knew my distress signal. If I'm like, I'm not sure about this situation, um, I might need your help. And so we had that communication. So as administrators and, leader, and leaders in the schools and leaders in the community, we have to come together and talk about how we want to actually uh, do discipline in the schools before the incidents occur. And so the, la um, the other thing I just wanna mention, and I, uh, if you haven't looked up the concept of microaggressions and what they can do 
uh, to people over time in all situations, whether they're young or as adults, microaggressions are very similar to uh, death from a thousand cuts because it's little things that people are doing each and every day. And our young ladies are suffering from microaggressions from every direction. And we as a community have got to do better with that. So I'll end by saying, and, and I know I'm, I'm kind of, you know, we're talking about things in a global um, uh, context, but in order to, to solve this, we need to understand the harm, we need to contextualize the harm, and we need to repair the harm. We have to understand it, contextualize it. And when I say contextualize it, we have to understand our historical racial literacy. Many of us do not understand what has happened to the black community over the last 400 years, but we want to treat it as if they're the black people in the community are victims and we are not. We are a product of our history and we have to understand the trauma, trauma associated with that history. Police officers and residents must speak up when you see something wrong now in the correct way, but you have to speak up. And as residents and community members, we have to be very cognizant when we call the police and what exactly we're doing. So I'll end what I'm saying by, by just asking the questions. What are we teaching our young people when we treat them like this? What are we teaching them? What are we teaching them when we lack empathy in our approach? And how are we holding one another accountable in these situations? How are we doing that? Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh Felicia Jones, Ms. Jones, what, 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 what do you see as a way of de-escalating these kinds of situations? So, uh, you know, organizationally, I'm, I, uh, I'm the associate director with Congregations Organized for Prophetic Engagement COPE. We uh, primarily work on systems change. And so oftentimes we ascribe sort of a systems change solution to these incident, uh, incidents like this. And so what we have have done um, is really push for our school districts to change policy uh, and institute new practice. Um, you know, I, I referenced earlier the the practice of using arrests and citations and suspensions, but when we actually got um, the school district and the board leadership um, and the administration to uh, immediately respond by putting a moratorium, we saw a 90% reduction in, uh, upwards of 90% reduction in school arrests, citations, and uh, suspensions, which is huge. That's at least, the, that's one step. Um, and, you know, the more that we can um, reduce the exposure to law enforcement for young people early, the less likely that they would uh, come in to be funneled into the school to prison pipeline. But the other thing that we also realized that's part of, that can be part of a solution to addressing uh, student, student behaviors, uh, school climate issues, is something that we didn't know would surface, but came out of a focus group that we had with parents. And that was that oftentimes when there's an incident in school, um, there, the, there's an escalation with the parent too. <laughs> And sometimes we have practices that actually deny and push the parent out. So now the parent is no longer a, um, can no longer be a partner in addressing behavior, which then sort of leaves this, the teacher administrator with only sort of one um, resort, and that is law enforcement. And that is actually the wrong response. And so some of our parents started to ask for uh, for parents to be restored, for the relationship between their school teachers, their administrators to be restored so that they could then have the kind of relationship that they needed to, to support their children in school. And that was, um, I think that was, that, that was a critical piece that oftentimes is, miss, oftentimes is missing, you know, because we, um, and then what we do when a parent shows out, for, for lack of a better way to describe it, at a school, we, we not only um, ban the student, but now that, that ban the parent, but now that student is tagged as the problem student and the problem parent. Um, and, uh, and, we, and we don't get uh, very far when we don't really work on those, those dynamics and those relationships. And so there, if there is, there is any additional advice, because I think Dr. Holt has, has laid out, um, Jones Holt laid out a, um, laid out some great uh, recommendations, but really from a community parent standpoint, 
there are some additional ways and things that we can do with parents to uh, try and mitigate that. There, there's things that we can do in, in terms of policy. Uh, again, to really try and reduce uh, the child's exposure to, to policing, law enforcement, and really to uh, the criminalizing effects of uh, what that has really for black children. And so I, I, I think I just wanna add that as part, of, as part of our collective thinking and hopefully part of our collective problem solving when we really look at um, our practices in the classroom and our practices uh, in the district at large. Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Sullivan, de-escalation um, strategies that you may have or some type of program or what can, what can we do? So, I, you know, I, I listened to the lady speak and it, it, it's it, one of the things is very clear is that a lot of the um, things that we're talking about are so um, interconnected. And, uh, and so as to not try to pitch a, a program or any of that, so I'm not, not gonna pitch a program, I am going to mention a framework that I developed recently um, called the Quantum 10, and it is a framework, a fusion of frameworks, practices, and, um, and, and uh, theories that we all know very well. Um, and I'm going to show you the graphic in just a moment, but I wanted to say that what we need to do is not work, work in these theories, practices, and frameworks in silos. And so what we've often done is we, you know, we, you know I've, I've worked across four counties, um, and I've been at a PBIS school, I've been at a restorative school, I've been at a culturally re responsive school, I've been at so many different schools that I'm wondering, you know, uh, why aren't we doing all of, why aren't we practicing rather than doing, why aren't we practicing all of these theories, framework, works, and, and um, practices, why aren't we doing all of these things in tandem? And so as I ask that question, um, I, I show you the framework because, well, I want to show you the framework, but it, it doesn't want to cooperate. So uh, basically it's, it's comprised of theories like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, minds, growth mindset, um, also practices like restorative practices, um, uh, PBIS, you know, well, that's a framework, but just to kind of give you an idea of what it's comprised of and what I'm, what I'm asking us is to consider doing these things in tandem versus in silos. And so the universe wants me to show it. So it's coming up right now. And so I want, I want you to kind of see the graphic because it kind of helps you to visualize what I'm saying. Cause a lot of people are like, but you know, you're not going to only do one at a time. And in my mind, I'm like, if we were only practicing one at a time, then what we have done is at the trauma-informed school, we probably would have been okay with the baby who was, we would have captured the heart of the baby who was um, you know, taken away at six years old. We would have been like, okay, we know what to do. She's experiencing some trauma in the midst of being handcuffed. So we stop, we pause. We already know that we should not put these handcuffs on this baby because our, our, our trauma-informed training teaches us that this will traumatize this kid possibly for life. We've covered that, but what happens when we have a situation where the student is um, is experiencing some challenges behaviorally? And I'm not saying they're doing something bad, but they're experiencing something. If we if we've only been trained in trauma, but we haven't been trained in restorative practices, how do we know to be restorative when it comes to that kid kicking the teacher? You know, how come we can't stand up and say today's a new day? You know, um, and and I'm not pretending that I'm perfect and that I've always said today's a new day. I'll tell you a story. I know when I lost. I lost, I'll, remember, I'll never forget, I was working as an administrator on a campus, and I got a little bit of a hot head sometimes, but I've had so much training that that hot head, I can keep, I can keep that lid down. It doesn't flip like it used to. And so because of that, um, I'm, I'm aware, but not being aware of my own behavior will traumatize our kids. And so I'll never forget, I was working on a campus as an administrator, and I had a young lady, and she was a black female. And so I don't want to pretend that, that, that only others traumatize our kids or are, um, you know, punitive with our kids. Sometimes we're punitive with our kids too. And so I remember going at it. Like she says something to me, I was like, say it again, see what happens. Say it again. We're going back and forth. And this is not acceptable. So I'm not portraying an acceptable um, behavior at this point, but this was, you know, lear a learning process for me. And that day I lost, I lost that day. And you want to know what I mean by I lost that day? She could not hear anything I was saying from that moment on. I wanted to reconcile. Didn't happen. I went to the parents and said, I, I want to apologize. And I really want to get through your daughter. The parents didn't want to hear it. Saw the girl years later, literally, 
And I guarantee you, my face might be coming up in her, in her mind and she's cringing, you know? Years later, saw her and wanted to speak and just really try to reconcile and wanted nothing to do with me. I lost. And so I'm saying what we can do is we can be restorative, but we can also be preventative. We can make sure that we're not only giving our students the behavior expectations, because with positive behaviors, interventions, and supports, you don't only you don't have to follow. It's a framework. You don't have to follow the cookie cutter where they say, tell your kids they need to do this. You get to create that. In our classrooms, we need to be co-creating with our students the expectations for the classroom behavior. On our campuses, we need to have our student body involved with ensuring that they that that we're co-crafting um, behavioral expectations. How do we behave as a as a quantum kid or as a quantum school? How do we how do we want to show our our appreciation? How do we want to show our disappreciation? We want to make sure that we're doing those things with students. And that's one of the restorative practices is doing things with students rather than to or for them. We need to make sure that we're doing things with kids and with our staff. Um, we want to make sure that we are, are thoughtful when we're talking about cultural responsive practices, again, a framework. We're not, I'm not telling you what it looks like on your school. Every school is going to be culturally different. What we're saying is, have some culturally responsive practices for the students that you serve. Ensure that if you have language learners, that you have some, some practices that will assure that they are successful. If you have students that are coming from a different background, neighborhood, it may not be a language you know, barrier. Maybe it is, maybe it is um, some sort of other barrier. Then we're make, we want to make sure that we have some artifacts for those students to be able to see themselves, whether they're you know, um, African-American or Black, however they identify Asian, Latinx, um, you know, indigenous. I can keep naming this, whether they are a millennial, a centennial, you know, we want to make sure that we are um, working with our students versus working to them or for them or not even at all. So when we ask about de-escalation specifically, first let's try to be preventative and let's work on working with our kids, building those relationships is the key. Um, and I think it was Rita Pearson who, um, you know, she's deceased now, but Rita Pearson said, I think she said, kids don't learn from people they don't like. Mm -hmm. You know, and when she said, that resonates with me because if they don't like you, our mentality sometimes is saying, well, that's their problem. I got mine. They need to get theirs. And what we need to do is we need to, we need to change our mindset. And that's where growth mindset comes in on the framework. And we need to make sure that we are looking at it from a perspective of how do we, how do we cultivate our students? How do, we, how do we ensure that our students are included in on everything that we're doing day to day? So I'm gonna pause there and say de-escalation starting with being pre preventative, but then also allowing for the students to have space. And so after I told you guys I lost with that one student, the way I started to proceed as an administrator, I would say, you know, I would go to my campus security because we had campus security and I would be like, hey, can I talk to you for a moment? You know, our daughter over there, we need to, can somebody walk our daughter to class? Because remember the, the last time I just asked her to go to class, she almost flipped her lid. So we want to make sure that we are not challenging our students and that we don't have a power struggle. Because some of us are, are we think we, we think we are the, you know, we're the, we are the powerhouse and we have to make sure that we lay down the law. Well, sometimes you have to back off and sit down. And so I, we can start to walk away and allow for students to de-escalate on their own, allow for them to have the space and the time that they need to walk away. We cannot challenge students in the middle of them being upset or angry. What we can do is allow for that moment because we don't control that and we can't control that. All we're doing is fuel, putting, adding fuel to the fire. We can give them a moment on campus if they need it because they're not going to process in that classroom anyway. We're not being exclusionary when we're doing that. We're giving them time to process how they're going to manage their emotions. And so there are so many different things that we can do in order to ensure that our students are, um, are, are safe on our campuses, because that's the point. So I'm going to pause there, because I'll keep going, too. OK. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm going to have one last comment from um, Felicia. And then I'll summarize, because we have people that want to ask a question. Oh, so I want to make sure that we get to that. Felicia, great, go great. ahead. Have one yeah, question. thank you. Thank you for taking that one comment. It just, I was triggered, uh, I thought about it uh, by both Dr. Sullivan and Dr. Uh, Holt's comments. And there was something, I think one of the things we should also, um, would be helpful from both administrators and teachers is to, is really to look at trends and patterns. Uh, we started to look at data uh, and we saw 
that uh, re uh, referrals happen at certain points in the day and happen with certain teachers and also happen at certain seasons throughout the year. So, you you know, there's there's some some patterns. Uh, teacher is tired, student is tired. Uh, where March, you see a, a heightened number of suspensions, transfers, um, people are starting to fatigue and that's just natural. I imagine after you've been teaching, you get to a point in the school year where you're exhausted. Mm -hmm. I do think it's important to pay attention to that um, and then also to, you know, to think about what's happening instructionally that supports the environment so that it doesn't, um, it doesn't become um, difficult for students when both the teacher and the student are fatigued and that turns into a situation or administrator for that, for that matter. I just want to say that I think that certainly made paying attention and making sure there's an institutional practice around data, data sharing, looking at trends would, very, would help in terms of how we um, address what's going on with, in t with the whole school climate um, so that it's, it supports students and, and, and teachers well. Oh, no, thank you. Yes, that is important to have that data, to have that information so you can make data-driven decisions and informed decisions, absolutely. So I'm going to wrap this up. Um, I do have a couple of comments, um, uh, which some of you talked about, but looking at the policies, we talked briefly about zero tolerance, but um, parents, family, community members, administrators, look at your board policies to see what they are regarding discipline. So you won't be surprised at that. So if there's a zero tolerance policy at your school, you'll know exactly what's supposed to happen or what exactly is happening. And you may want to um, make sure that you go out there and vote on the school board members who are your um, representing your school and making these decisions at that level. Because as a professor of educational leadership, I train and help people get those jobs regarding uh, being administrators, uh, school leaders, um, working with boards and working with the community. So you want to make sure you do that. Uh, number two, the other thing that you want to look for is cu culturally proficient leaders, people who will understand and try to work with uh, you as a different culture, if you will. Uh, black females obviously have a different culture. We are the ones that say, hey girl, that's us all the way. That's a language that we have. There's attitudes, there's behaviors, all of that uh, encompasses who we are. In looking at that though, we also want to make sure that as administrators, we uh, respect those that bring a different uh, culture to the school. Uh, we call that funds of knowledge. We also call that um, just looking at and appreciating the different cultures that are there. Um, another comment that I want to make is black girls tend to get suspended and expel more for things that are subjective, meaning that people interpret differently. But, you know, it's not always the case. What they think may be going on, it, it may not really be. So there are subjective kinds of things. That's what our girls seem, seem to get um, suspended for, disrespective, disruptive, those kinds of things. And then um, one last, and we do know, number four, we do know that historically there's been a strained relationship between the two groups. So we have to work on that, building trust and building the relationships. Um, and the last thing is, when we talk about closing the opportunity gap, that cannot happen without closing the discipline gap. Because this discipline gap means that our children, our girls are not in classes, they are not in the classrooms and not hearing instruction. So that means they are absent of that, they are not there, and so how can they continue to learn and be um, passing classes and pass if they're not there to get the instruction? So there are many things that we can do, but we've got to work together with families and partner. And that means equitable partnerships, not just one or the other. So I'm going to end there and we're going to go in and give it back to Yvette. And Yvette says that there are people ask, wanting to ask questions. And so we'll pose those to the panel. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, for the insight, for the wealth of knowledge and information that you brought. Um, personally, thank you for validating me as a Black girl in school. 
um, that is priceless to me. Aww. So thank you. We've got some questions here from the audience that I want to pose to all of you and please give your own perspectives, each one of you on these. So what strategies can you recommend um, for deepening in inter their interactions with black girls in the educational systems? Um, do our panelists want to comment on this? Uh, well, I'll just say, I think we uh, responded to that. I don't know, I, I saw that question earlier, but if any of you want to bring some other things up, then would, I mean, I thought each of you brought some strategies, but if there's anything else that you want to add to that. I, think um, I can maybe put it into a, a, a kind of a bow um, and to say that what we've been talking about are increasing your cultural proficiency. Get to know who black girls are. If you're not one, get to know a few. And because we're not all the same, Right. We don't all think the same. We don't all act the same. So increase your cultural proficiency as it relates to not only Black girls, but also Black women. Um, and understand and listen to our stories with an unbiased eye. So the second thing is to check your own bias and your own implicit bias and your own stereotypes. Because many times when you walk into rooms, and I actually had this um, happen to me where I, as superintendent, I'm sitting there and um, you meet one-on-one -on -one with your folks. You have, uh, typically, the, when you get the job, you ask people to come in and they want to meet with you one-on-one -on -one just to get to know you. Some of them are scoping you out to see what kind of person you are. And I had a uh, classified worker come in to me and he said, you know, gal, this is after an hour talking to me and asking me every question known to man. And he said, you know, gal, you don't fit none of my boxes. And I said, well, sir, tell me a little bit more about your boxes. Well, you're not the angry black woman. You're not the uppity black woman. You're not the, and he had a whole laundry list that he went through. And it took everything in me to just laugh because that's what I did. I just kind of chuckled at it like, well, I'm glad I don't fit your own boxes. I, I tend to like to make my own box. This, and, you know, I kind of moved it over. But I did also let him know in that moment, and I took my power back. And I said, please recognize that what you just said and understood, I understand we're breaking down biases, but I hope you're going to continue to walk through those biases um, for yourself, because those came from somewhere. And I don't know that they came from interactions with actual Black women. And I left it at that. And so um, understanding and recognizing your own implicit bias, I'm doing training on restorative practices and the restorative process, because when harm is done to you or by you, it needs to be addressed. And also, I would say understand epigenetics and understand microaggressions, because microaggressions are as simple as saying, oh, you know, can I touch your hair or, oh, no. Um, and, under, you know, so there are some cultural norms when it comes to Black women that we need to understand. And the last thing I would say that, you know, just don't judge people by what you see on the outside. Oftentimes our young ladies are trying to find their own identity. And I'll admit, there are some things that our young girls do, my daughter in particular, who's in the room right now, uh, receiving her own form of discipline, Dr. Sullivan, uh, for not <laughs> uh, for not going to not, not attending one of the classes. She's in here writing out her schedule. But again, the discipline fits the con uh, the consequence fits the action. She missed her schedule, so she's in a writer schedule. That's what she's talking about. But um, understanding that um, we are not all the same. And um, even though our young girls may do something, they may talk in a certain way, they may throw an attitude at you. We, are, we tend, some of us, to be a little attitudinal and, and sometimes we don't even know why. Offer some grace and empathy when it comes to that. And, and Dr. I'll, Sullivan. I'll, inter I'll interject and say, I just kind of wanted to express a little bit, um, to dig a little deeper because I know that we often come to conversations like this because we've been told, check your biases. We've been told, build relationships, but we, we're not really sure how or what that looks like or what type of questions should I ask or what type of questions shouldn't I ask. So I, I definitely want to encourage you to get into dialogues, you know, get into any type of, anytime you see there's something about race talk or anytime you see there's something about, um, you know, and actually Riverside County and San Bernardino actually have a partnership with, you know, together where we're doing a race talk series, but um, go to those conversations, engage in those conversations in that space. It's, it's a safe space. But it's a brave space. We ask people to speak their truth. We ask people to um, to actually, um, you know, inquire, ask questions. And so when we talk about checking your biases, um, Dr. Shelley mentioned both check your implicit and explicit biases because sometimes with the implicit bias, it's so much easier to check. You know, you can check that. You might not do anything about it, but you know it's there. With the impl implicit biases, you don't you don't even know you have it. You don't know why you did this when the girl walked in the room. And you're like, ugh. 
she's done nothing to you. You know, we're asking you to figure that out. We're asking you to ask yourself. So, so this is the thing. We're not asking you to beat yourself up. I'm not saying call yourself a horrible person. I'm not saying, you know, any of that. I'm saying what you need to do is think about that thought and say, hey, wait, 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 wait. I don't even know this girl or I don't even know this woman. Why am I thinking this? And let me interrupt that thinking right now with, let me get to know the person. Let me figure out what's, what, the, what substance is behind that. Um, and that's how you're going to do that. So find some conversations about those types of things, implicit and, and, um, and explicit biases. Find some conversations about microaggressions because you can read about implicit bias, microaggressions, and building relationships. It's not the same as actually getting involved and figuring out what does that look like. So in addition to doing all of the checks and balances with looking at those things, you know, dig deep into some conversations about them and ask questions um, in detail. Ms. Felicia Jones, would you like to respond? Thank you. I think that I think these ladies have uh, have said so much, and I would just put a check mark by everything that they've said. Just uh, and just end it with just saying, just just let girls be girls and love on them. Uh, and I think you will have, you will uh, nurture the kind of relationship that you want with them. Thank you. And I uh, do know that um, our panelist, Felisa Jones, will be having to leave us soon. Um, I wanted to thank you. I uh, canvassed for you and Ms. Demita at COPE, and I wanted to go ahead and ask you for any final remarks. Thank you. I was, uh, yes, thank you so much for, for uh, supporting us in that way. Uh, I am just, uh, want to just thank uh, each of you for this, this incredible opportunity to talk about something that is so important. And uh, to just, you know, what we're dealing with uh, in, the in the national climate and that so much can happen uh, in our schools and how we develop our young scholars, but also how we develop our educational leaders to really to, to think differently about um, how we how we develop our, our babies. Um, and the kind of future that they can have and really, uh, you know, I think our prayer is that there will, there will be a day when uh, law enforcement is not uh, so rooted in our school practice and is not so deeply rooted and associated with what is good for Black kids. Um, you know, I think we can reimagine that. I think we can see that uh, we are investing in academic supports. We are investing in more exposure to college and career opportunities and that becomes the new norm uh, for us. And so much of that happens when we have visionary leaders and community and parents and partners working together to make that a reality. So I thank you so much for the time and opportunity part of this conversation. And I will, uh, I will have to uh, leave the Zoom now, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Felicia. Talk to you soon, Felicia. Thank you for being with us. As you all know, we have our recurring commentator, Stan Fudge from Western Action Group, and I did want to get your insight as well from your perspective. Uh, so much information. I, I, I was almost overwhelmed. I watched that the both films, and I couldn't believe. I've, I've seen them on TV. I saw both of them on TV, and, and both times I've just scratched my head and said, how, why, and, and uh, you know, what, what happened? And, and I... It, I think we need to look at two things. And we've had this conversation before. The conversation we've had is uh, campus police versus uh, city police. And, and I think a lot of you made the, the uh, uh, analogy that once the city police gets on campus, you're dealing with the penal code. As long as you have campus police, you're dealing with educational code. And so, and I think that's very, very uh, true. And, and so, but at the same time, we really wish that, like Ms. Jones said, that the policing part of our daily school day is minimal. We want that to be the minimum. We want, truly, we want to be invisible. We don't want to see the, uh, our campus police or the, the city police on our campus because when they're there, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Also, um, I'm not sure what the young lady's name is. Uh, she's a rapper and she's doing a, she just on 
Saturday Night Live last week, and she did uh, uh, Care for the Black Woman, and and she's doing a, uh, she has a rap that it's, it's really powerful. But uh, uh, that was on TV today on the news, and what was on the news was I did not know this, but fifty four percent of Black women are abused or stalked in their life, 54%, that's a huge number. It's a numbers and the stats and all the information that comes, that comes around. It's so important that we do know that and two, we act on it. You know, say something, you see something, say something. We need to say something. When we see the numbers in the Samuel Unified School District as 90% and not one white person has ever crossed the line it's hard to believe if it's if it's true. I want to see what they're doing in the white in, in the white household because whatever they're doing, we need to do in the black household. But the bottom line is, is when numbers are that off, we need to say something. And I and I know that the Samuel Union Rice School District uh, and I seen Felicia at many meetings, um, and I miss having live meetings, but uh, I've seen her in action. And we need to go. We need to be at those platforms. Well, we can make a difference. It's, it's, it's one thing to, to sit here and, and talk about it, but it's a major thing to go to those meetings and, and, and demand that things change in those school districts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stan, for your contributions to the conversation. Every week, always insightful. I wanna ha go ahead and hand it back to Dr. Luke. I know that you wanted to go ahead and have final remarks or comments from your own colleagues as well as any further questions that you have for them. No, um, I thought you did you not have any more questions because- Oh, have... we did have, um, uh, Dr. Texaria did have some questions <laughs> of her own that she yeah, wanted to ask. So please, uh, doctor. I, did, I actually didn't have a question as, yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, I, I appreciate, I so appreciate, I knew this was going to be fantastic. I knew it was going to be, and Angela was all like, I don't know, I don't know, no, but this was, this was really, this was fantastic. Maybe I shouldn't tell your secrets, right, Angela? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you were, you all were great though. Um, and I appreciate, oh, I don't know who said it, but someone said a child does not learn from someone they don't like. And, and I would like to turn that idea on its head and, and, and say, as Paulo Freire did, that uh, if you don't love a child, you cannot teach that child. So it goes both ways, right? I remember uh, my neighbor told me uh, a long time ago that you know she was a teacher for many, many years. And she said there was this one child in her classroom who was just acting up. Now she's white and I kind of, felt like she's talking about a black kid. You know, she didn't, she was too shy to say or whatever, but she said, there was this little boy in my class and he was acting up, he was all over the place. And she said, what I did was I drew a big circle in the middle of the room and I said, Johnny, you can do anything you want as long as you stay in the circle. And she said, Johnny stayed in the circle. He didn't, you know, and these are, these are the kinds of teachers that we, we care about, you know, the people who can understand their own biases and not act on those biases and who, uh, who will love our children. She loved Johnny. And it was real obvious when she was telling this story that she really loved this child. And Johnny was like, he was perfect uh, the whole rest of the year. But I guess my question to you is uh, not related to Johnny's story, but um, do the data support the idea that we do not need, or maybe that's a, the wrong research question, that do we need campus police or do the data support the idea that we, that they are not necessary, that we could be spending, you know, because a lot of times you have more police than counselors on, on, on campus. And we need counselors. We don't need, I, in my estimation, uh, you know, because the police, the police are going to police. You know, police is also a verb, and they're going to police. So everything they see will be a potential police problem. 
So I'm just wondering to, you know, just to get your thoughts on whether you are ready to give up campus police. If, if I can um, start first by saying, sure. um, as, I, as I process and I think about um, the biases, I just kind of want to put everyone, I want to just reiterate that you're going to have thoughts. Um, what you do next is what's important. And so I want to leave that with you so that you, you know, that you can start to disrupt those thoughts. And then to uh, Mary's question, I didn't do any research on um, whether or not the police are um, necessary on the schools or if we should have them versus this or that. What I will say is working on a campus where I, where I worked with campus security guards on campus, I think it all depends on what your purpose for having the individuals on campus. And I worked with some um, law enforcement officers that as, as Dr. Shelley mentioned, she, her officers were trained. I would see those, those individuals on campus for the safety of the students on the campus and not necessarily um, trying to keep them from doing something they shouldn't be doing. And so in my mind, if we're keeping them safe based on what's happening in the community, that's one thing versus are we having the police there or campus security there to police the students. And so I don't think police officers should be policing students. Um, and so there should be a safety factor involved um, with that and not from each other, but from the community and, and maybe and, and not the community as in the community is bad, but something that may take place and we have the proper protection that we need to ensure that our kids are um, actually have individuals that they can look to when something is going on and they don't know how to respond. Um, so um, again, that's not a research base because I didn't do the research on that, but I've been in schools, I've been in districts, and, and from my own perspective, um, depending on how you use those resource officers, it's what would determine whether or not you actually need them on campus. And again, I do agree that we need counselors. Um, my own experience growing up in school, I didn't know that counselors were, I didn't know they exist. I don't remember ever meeting with a guidance counselor all the way through to my senior year. Never, I might have, so I don't want to say I didn't in case my guidance counselor is like, I remember you from, I just don't remember meeting with anyone in any of my years. And so I would say we do need them because sometimes we end up in a different road. But then again, those individuals also need to be trained because as Dr. Shelley probably knows and anyone else who's worked in the school system, we have some guidance counselors that are guiding our black and brown students into different paths when they clearly come in saying, hey, I'm interested in this. And someone tells them, well, maybe that's not something that you, you might be able to do. So I'm thinking that whoever you have in campus is working on working over your students that, again, I showed you guys that diagram of making sure that those individuals are very well prepared to work with our students, specifically our historically underserved and marginalized kids. I'm going to uh, build upon that and um, just say, how do I put this in the, in the best way possible? Uh, and I would be honest with you, I'm kind of torn because part of my work is with police officers <laughs> and school districts. And so um, at, at, the, at the risk of saying, you know, we really actually do not need police in schools, uh, at the same time, that's what I work with is uh, police officers and, and administrators to work together. Um, I would say based on the data that we know about adverse childhood experiences and the impact of adverse childhood experiences on young people and what we need to reverse the impact of child of adverse childhood experiences on um, um, that in addition to and when I say that I mean that uh, we know that it takes 30 minutes a day of adult interaction to uh, reverse the impact of trauma in children 30 minutes a day of adult it doesn't mean to be continuous it could be 30 different adults just saying hello and how you doing and what's going on with you it could be a counselor and this is um research out of kimberly papillon's um work Kimber kimberly papillon also talks about the fact that we know that there are um implicit biases within the ranks of our police officers in our um, law enforcement uh, in our judicial system we know this we know this from the shoot no shoot test we know this based on the correlation between um, full sentences and the hue or the African nature of their features. Um, Kimberly Papillon's research can um, definitely help you um, understand that a bit better. We know from our research on um, the impacts of trauma in our communities and the epigenetic impact of trauma that I spoke about earlier that if we're going to truly deal with the impact of trauma and that mind you i'm just talking about trauma 
I'm not talking about the 400 years of, of snatching people from a country and enslaving them. I'm not talking about Jim Crow. I'm not talking about redlining and the black codes and you know everything that has happened after that. I'm not talking about the war on drugs and the three strikes you're outlaw and then the zero tolerance. And I haven't even mentioned all of that. But if we were to consider all of that as well, then the answer is a profound no. The last thing we need in schools is any further policing. What we need in schools is more support for the trauma that our children, the adults, and the system itself have experienced. When you take that out, you can also consider the community and the family. The fact of the matter is we are walking around in trauma. What's going on right now with our leaders arguing with each other, the fact that a fly became the, the biggest news story on some man's head. I mean, this is traumatizing. No matter which way you turn it, what we are experiencing in many senses, seeing the um, destruction of our, our, of our governmental system, seeing you know, things like anti-racism training being uh, considered outlawed. I mean, all of these things, this is traumatic. These are traumatic experiences for those of us in education right now. And so when you consider all of this trauma within our families and a pandemic and everything that's happening, the over-policing, bro going to broken windows, which was referred to as broken windows policing in some areas of our community, which became um, kind of a, a way of doing business. Um, and the fact that we have never, ever addressed on a systemic level the racism that we have uh, a history of here in the United States of America and the history of the police department being based in racism. I know right here in Detroit where I am, the, the police department was literally formed because the slave cartel, the, the marshals that were sent here from Washington to, of course, back in 1845 to corral the um, slaves from the uh, Fugitive Slave Act, they decided they couldn't catch them all. So they, uh, like the federal government does, they pull out and say, you need to take care of that as a state. And that is the formation of the state police department in many states. Um, and so based on these facts alone, we can safely say that there is not a need for police in the system to police children. What we do need is supports in the, in the system to support the children and the adults to figure out a system to get better together. I, um, I've been in this game of, of a minute, I can, and, what I, and I may not look it, uh, but I've been in this game over 20 years. And I can tell you when I started um, uh, teaching and when I started to become an administrator, we didn't have zero tolerance. We didn't have the police in the schools and we were expected as administrators to handle what was going on in our campus. That was an expectation. You called the police and quite frankly, your other administrator friends would look at you like, what do you mean you, you called the police for what? And then we're looking now you know, 20 some odd years later, and it's a norm for them to be stationed on campus. Blows my mind some days that we've come that far along. And I say that to say, at what point, even when we had the greatest war on drugs and what was happening in the 80s with um, the Crips and the Bloods, and we didn't have a need for police to be on campus. So why would we have the need now? And so we as a community have to really take a long, hard look at ourselves and like everyone's saying, reimagine public education, reimagine our communication with one another, and begin to truly heal and contextualize the harm that we've been experiencing. I'll, I'll uh, answer Dr. Texera. I, I can say that I haven't seen anything in the research about um, school policing being a benefit, particularly for Black girls. Let me just say that. Um, if, if nothing else, it's been traumatizing, as that word has been used today, and um, stifling for, for um, Black girls. So for right now, I would say uh, not now. Um, there may be other research out there that I haven't seen about that that may show otherwise, but not right now. And inclusive of that is the zero tolerance. That works against children of color, period that just works against us. And so when we have police and the policies to kind of back them up, then that um, school resource officers to back them up, then that is, it's, it's not a good site for, for our kids. Um, so I, I'll just answer it like that. Uh, we do know that it takes um, one to two persons, an adult on campus to build that relationship and that trust with a kid, just one. So if it's going to be a resource officer or a police, then fine. 
Um, but it has to build that trusting relationship, that give and take, um, that thing that we call cultural capital that Black parents have when they come to campus, that they bring capital with them, that they know something a little bit about uh, raising kids or um, having a Black child or, you know, whatever it is. But to have that kind of respect is, um, is needed and is um, pertinent to uh, having a positive relationship on the campus and building those equity partnerships. So I'll, I'll stop there because I know it's uh, getting late too. So anything else? I wanted to touch on something that Dr. Shelley said too. She talked about she talked about epigenetics and um, mm -hmm. my you know a couple different things where my my jaw dropped to the mouth. So I did, dropped to the ground. I wanted to say two two or three things. First, when we if you think about the historical timeline and you think about all of the things that have taken place over a period of time, um, and it it baffled me to realize as an adult I realized that some of the things that happened in the school system, you know, was done intentionally. When we talked about you know, exclusionary practices on purpose, excluding black, black and brown students from, um, from school on purpose. And I can't remember the quote, I can't remember the, who, who said the quote, but somebody else will when I say, they talked about raking some of the rubbish from the, from the, um, from the, from the group or whatever. Horace Mann, yep. Okay. Horace so, Mann, yeah, the founder and father of American education. Yeah, yeah, so something, but they weren't even including blacks at that time or Latinx, because there were only, there were only white, white individuals in schools. And so when we talk about that, now imagine having blacks integrated into the school systems and talking about raking some rubbish from the, from the, from the group. Um, that's one thing I wanted to remember, I wanted to remind us when we talk about reimagining education versus just like disrupting the system and, you know, patching it together, but reimagine what we could do if we were to take a look at the fact that this system wasn't designed for certain students, black and brown specifically, and how do we reimagine this so that we can say there's some things that students are going to come with that we don't quite understand. How do we understand that and, and allow for the students to be expressive and have let them have that moment that they had and come in with a new day? So that's one thing. And then the second thing I mentioned was epigenetics. And imagine this, audience, if Dr. Shelley mentioned the um, DNA that was changed as they did that research with um, people who survived the Holocaust. Can you imagine what your black students are your black students are going through as we talk about trauma and you know pretty much when I learned about epigenetics and it's not my area of research but I, like I looked at it a little bit when I first heard about it. If we if that term is really talking about experiencing the trauma of your ancestors, can you m imagine what? hundreds of years of enslaved individuals are experiencing, and that is me. And we hear a lot of black individuals say, you know, I was never oppressed. And I wanna say out loud that, okay, I understand that you don't remember and you didn't feel it and you didn't experience it firsthand personally in your own right, but the very existence of your being here, the little different side came out, is really oppression. It's a little bit of oppressed. Not to say that we're victims, because I think Dr. Shelley said that also. We're not trying to be a victim. I'm not trying to say, please help me now. Help me, help me, help me. What I'm really just trying to say is that there's something that's happening. There's something that's happening with our girls. There's something that's happening with our boys. And we need to acknowledge that there's some historical, deep-rooted trauma and genetics that have been, have been mutated in our system that is causing us to have some challenges that people are not addressing from a trauma lens from a restorative lens, we're just throwing it down like, why don't the kids just behave? Just If they just do what they're supposed to do, then we will all be good. And we have to really pause that and get to a point where what we're saying is, I understand some things that my, or maybe I don't understand, but I wanna empathize. I wanna see if I can really put myself in a situation where I ask you questions like, how was your day? You know, um, and so that we understand that kids are kicking and throwing stuff, that there's something that has probably taken place before they walked into your room, maybe it was yesterday, we all respond differently. Can we ask questions, how are you? Like, um, can you tell me about what's going on? You know, and not, what's wrong with you, why you do that? You know, ask me about me first. So I'm, 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 I'm asking us to really ask our students questions. I'm asking us to really pay attention to what the trauma that our, our students are experiencing, whether you know you've seen it. And we have to also stop saying, I experienced that same thing. I grew up in a single parent home. We have to stop comparing ourselves to what others are experiencing. And I'm, I'm saying all that because my daughter, I was a single mom when my daughter was growing up and then I got married when she was about 10. But she's had a loving family. 
you know, she's got her grandpa, her grandma, my husband came in, you know, uncles and aunts, but she experienced some, some things that I didn't understand and what she was experiencing, you know, she was, she was, she was mourning. And I don't understand that because I just don't understand. And what she's mourning is the fact that maybe she did grow up in a single parent home for the first part. And we didn't realize that until now that she's an adult and she's saying, mom, let's talk about this. I'm, I'm, I, this is real. I feel this. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm thinking, wait, why I did this? I was this mom. I was the soccer mom. The, you name it. I was that mom, you know, and then you had all these other people, but we cannot, we cannot, um, compare what others are experiencing just because you experienced it differently. Just because I experienced it differently, we have to listen and understand and we have to allow for them to heal. And I learned that when my daughter, as a 26 year old, I have to let her just feel. If you want to cry, okay. I have to stop asking, what you crying for? And I have to just let her cry. Sorry, passion. I know. Not anger. All very, yeah, no, I think we're all very passionate about this topic, so. Yes. Thank you all for answering that with amazing insight of course as always i want to go ahead um we're winding down and i want to hand it off to our panelists to give their final remarks as well as our recurring commentator stan fetch so um if you would each please go ahead and just leave us with your words i just wanted to say that um what, what uh, dr sullivan said is so true however implicit bias and micro bias is just uh, the school board that I've talked to and the school unions that I've dealt with, one of the biggest problems is they don't want any more training. They're tired of you telling me to do this and do that and do, and why should I, we have to do this and do that. And so with it, uh, the, the bias that's going on, it's gonna be a tough road to haul, but, I, for, but from today's conversation, I see there's a lot of good people doing a lot of good things. And I appreciate the, you ladies for being here and, and, and giving us our, your, just your insight on this uh, conversation and it's, it was beautiful, thank you. Well, hopefully I can give you a bit of hope because I actually have to leave this call to go and train a board on exactly what we're talking about here. So I can assure you that, I get, and, I, and you're right, they do not wanna continue to get training, but this topic, um, it's, it's starting to pick up and that's a very good thing for our schools. I can also echo your comments in that um, my police detail, uh, protection detail just ended in June um, because it, it gets that serious when people are fearful of, um, uh, of people bringing th different things to the community. And so the harassment and um, challenges that uh, we experience as, as leaders, even in the uh, walking this walk is real. Um, and so uh, I just want to echo that and just say, yeah, it, it's definitely real. Um, it was quite a shock that when, you know, it was recommended like, yes, we're going to put a police car in there. <laughs> I'm like, you're going to what? Me? I'm just a teacher. Yeah. And, um, you know, but there is that much of a, a pushback that you will experience um, when you start leading in this way, when you start leading for equity, when you start leading for cultural proficiency, when you start leading with uh, the kids first in mind and, and also leading for the adults. And so what I wanna um, kind of end with is, uh, and first of all, words of encouragement. Um, I'm hoping many of you are thinking about going into education or are just kind of looking at these um, issues from a more global perspective in that uh, policing in our community has uh, taken its toll on many different arena and, um, and we have to look at why it was uh, created to understand why it is there right now and then you know uh, why it is in the state that it's in right now and what we want it to look like moving forward um, but I do want to give you some hope that we're still in, in this fight fighting every single day for equity for all children and yes today we were talking specifically about, about black girls some days we're talking about our transgender um, ladies some days we're talking about um, uh, Latina, Latinx uh, young men. I mean, it, it all depends. We are in this fight for all children and that's the work of equity and anti-racism. And so if you have not uh, gotten on your cultural proficiency journey, if you have not picked up um, an equity text, if you have not been 
uh, researching and delving into what is anti-racism, please do um, jump into some of these topics and just start uh, making yourself more knowledgeable. No matter what field you go into, right now, um, Dr. Luke and Dr. Sullivan and I, we work with um, schools, districts, but we also work with corporations and we work with uh, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts and I mean you name it uh, everywhere on this uh, planet right now folks are really interested in the equity walk and so um, we're hoping that the work environments that you all are going to enter you will be able to one be yourselves and be and flourish but also be able to see when these things are happening and when you see something oh you're muted Dr. Jones. Oh, did it did it did it mute me? It just shut me up, huh? It just said hush up, lady. That was Zoom, just telling me to hush. <laughs> but um, well, I don't know where I, where it uh, hushed up at. But what what I was saying, what I'm getting at is that we have uh, we are preparing the world for you um, to come in and take you know the the reins from us as we move forward. And so the fight is a good fight. Um, it's not going to be without its bumps and bruises, but you will make it and you can do this work. I know it may feel sometimes like it's daunting, but it can be done. Lock arms with, you know, those of us who are here for you and know that we're always here to support you. We're a phone call or an email away. All right now we may be, you know, pictures on a screen, but each and every one of us, we're just black women. At the end of the day, we say, hey girl, how you doing? and we got you. So with that, I do need to take off because the, they're already texting me like, hey, your part's coming Thank up. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Sullivan. Thank you, Shelley, Dr. Jones. Hope. Thank you, yes, I, I think I pretty much um, want to just say I said it. I feel like I said it when I talked about the epigenetics, just mentioning that we just want to make sure that you understand that our students are, are, are girls specifically, but boys too um, of color, um, specifically our black students are experiencing some trauma um, some intergenerational trauma that um, that they don't even understand um, and that we don't understand. And so we're asking you to have some empathy to do some research so you can understand that. And just also um, stop policing our, our black girls um, and making sure that we, we look at a situation by situation. We're also, um, I don't know the term for it, but we're also looking at our girls as if they're adults. If you look at the 11 year old, she's taller. A lot of times with us African-American women, we are taller in stature. We are, you know, sometimes a little heavier and a lot of times people are looking at us like we are, um, we're dangerous and, um, and we're not. Um, also thinking about the passion that we hold sometimes, you know, um, I wrote a little something in a book that's coming, that's going to be coming out. Um, and it was um, about, you know, my arms may flail around, you know, I may get a little closer and lean in, my voice may, you know, my tone may raise, but that doesn't mean that I'm angry. You know, really, it just means that I'm passionate about whatever it is that I'm speaking at, speaking about. And so ask questions if you are concerned about my tone. You know, if I ask a question, you can ask me, what do I mean? If I say, did you mean that I need to do this or that? And I might be making an expression rather than having me change me, because that's what I've experienced my entire life is trying to flip and change so that everyone else is comfortable. Well, at some point we get tired of making sure that everyone else is comfortable, you know, and while everyone else gets to just be them, you know, a white woman goes, you know, and gets irate or upset, it's like, they're, they're, they're not considered as the angry white woman, but you see a black woman that gets a little raised in tone, we're, we're automatically pegged as the angry black woman. And so I'm asking us to, um, to just look at our, our, our girls um, as um, a child uh, and making sure that a whole child and making sure that we provide them with the resources and the support that they need to grow up to be beautiful adult women. Tell us that we're beautiful. You know, let us remind us that our hair is okay you know, and that our hair is beautiful instead of asking us questions about, oh, did you change your hair again? You know, just certain microaggressions that we um, spew out every day. We're just asking that you um, be more empathetic and um, not um, pass judgment and check your implicit and explicit biases um, and ask us questions. That's pretty much what I'm, I'm saying, ask questions. Thank you. And last but clearly not least, Dr. Luke was kind enough to even bring this event to fruition. Dr. Luke. Oh, thank you so much for having us. I'm so glad that my sister friends were able to join us. Um, I loved working with them. And I'll just end with a few other words. And those few words are, you know, we're not in this fight alone. So as um, Stan but said, you know, some people are tired of training. Well, we have to be lifelong learners. We can't know everything. And things change. Um, 
And so our kids are there depending on us to love them, but to learn about us as well. And so if you're gonna be in education, you have to continue to learn. It's a lifelong learning system kind of process. And so um, we can't give up and we have to make sure that people understand that we can't do it alone. Black people can't do it alone. We didn't do it alone for the civil rights movement. There were other people that joined in the movement because we didn't have all the resources. We didn't have all the human resources nor the, the uh, power even to, to make those changes, but it took everybody joining in together. Yes, we may have led the way, but we there are other people that had to join. So I just wanted to close with, um, when I talked with Dr. Texera, I was telling her about quickly a situation that happened at um, the University of Redlands when I was a professor there. And we um, had um, interviews for people to join in the program to go through the teacher education program. And we did have someone, a candidate who came in and basically said, I don't wanna teach black children. I mean, that's what she said. I don't wanna teach black children. And the question that we asked her was, why not? And she said, well, someone may, you know, if I get up to the board and write on the board, then they may shoot me in the back or something like that. So we do have people that are like that out there. We just ask that you not stay or go into education. Find something else to do, but we are wanting to not for you to over-police our girls and our kids and to support them, love on them, and help us all learn to be better educators um, as I teach and train people here at Cal State San Bernardino about um, being a leader, then be a leader. Let's we be equitable and equity leaders, uh, transformational, culturally proficient so that our kids can be successful. Thank you, doctor. And um, restorative. So, restorative, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate each and every one of your words throughout this conversation. I wanna go ahead and let everybody know that our episode next week is going to be on collisions at the crossroads, place, mobility, and policing in Southern California. It's there in the chat if you want a little more details. I just wanna say um, I enjoyed this conversation. I learned so much and thank you for giving me an opportunity to also sit and confront my own trauma as a black girl who's gone through school. Um, I want to tell everybody to protect our Black girls, weird, short, tall, trans, queer, protect us, protect our girls. And that's all I have for you all. Good night. Thank you for joining us and stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks, everyone. Fantastic job. Fantastic. Thank you, Yvette, for another, another good, uh, good program. We'll Thank talk you. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Sarah. Have a good evening. Thank you.